Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Larry Mohn, president of the Manhattan Institute, and it is indeed an honor to welcome you all to the second national meeting of the Adam Smith Society. I know many of you traveled great distances under adverse conditions, so I want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us this weekend. I also want to thank some of the Adam Society uh, lead donors, many of them are here tonight. Special thanks, of course, goes to Marilyn Fedak, without whose tremendous intellectual and financial leadership, the society would not exist. So thank you, Marilyn. And, and then there's, I don't know if Don Smith is here, but Don has helped uh, fund all of this uh, weekend's festivity. So I want to thank Don Smith in particular for that as well. It's been tremendous. And we also have uh, representatives from the uh, Templeton and the Goodrich Foundations, whose leadership and support is greatly appreciated. Uh, and while those resources are, are vitally needed, uh, the people who really make this work, I want to thank the directors of our Adam Smith program, Allison M Mangiero and Molly Harsh, and their deputy, Alyssa Yi, for all their hard work in putting this together. It really is amazing. We, we created the Manhattan Institute's Adam Smith Society to expose business school students to free market thinkers and entrepreneurial business leaders and to help promote a deep understanding of the moral and intellectual underpinnings of free enterprise. We wanted people to take capitalism seriously as an issue to think about. I know we've all been heartened by the response to our efforts around the country over the past two years. I'm proud to report that in the short time we have existed, we have chapters in 15 schools and count nearly 1,000 students now in our Adam Society network. And this is just the beginning. We will very soon be launching the Adam Smith Society 2.0. Our efforts will include, uh, among other things, a completely redesigned and upgraded website, a brand new interactive leadership directory that will connect all Adam Smith Society members, an e-newsletter that will be powered by the Institute's Economic Policy Center, E21, and offer original content on a range of economic and fiscal policy issues to all of our Adam Society members. And a newly invigorated presence on social media as well. And in celebration of our belief in competition, uh, the Adam Smith Society is hosting its first Instagram contest this weekend. Uh, through tonight and tomorrow, we will have fill-in cards available during breaks and receptions. Use these cards to define one of the following words, competition, innovation, success, or entrepreneurship. Then post your pictures to Instagram using the hashtag SmithTalk14. The, the most creative, inspiring answers will win some very interesting prizes. We thought a lot about those prizes, so I think you'll enjoy them. All submissions must be entered by 4 p.m. on Saturday, and the winners will be announced at the closing cocktail reception. Uh, now, it's, it's my uh, honor to introduce our keynote speaker uh, this evening, an extraordinary man and a good friend, Dr. Carl Schramm. Uh, trained as an economist and a lawyer, Carl is also very much an entrepreneur. He has founded a number of very innovative companies in the healthcare, finance, and information technology arenas. In 2002, he was named the president and CEO of the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and quickly set about building its reputation as the go-to foundation for knowledge about entrepreneurship. Under Carl's leadership, the foundation sponsored all of the most important research and writing relating to the critical role of the entrepreneur in economic activity. And I'm pleased to say Carl was an early and enthusiastic supporter of our efforts at the Adam Smith Society under his direction the Kaufman Foundation was very instrumental in getting this started up. He's also an accomplished author in his own right. Most recently, he co-authored two books very much worth your time. In 2008, uh, the book Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism, and more recently, in 2012, a book titled Better Capitalism. Uh, Bill Gates noted about the last book that he hoped the book will inspire a new generation to stretch the reach of market forces and create new businesses that drive economic growth while also helping to solve the problems of the world's poorest. Carl has served on White House panels in the Bush and the Obama administrations. 
He's advised the governments across the globe. He has been bestowed with numerous uh, awards and honorary degrees. I mention those only to encourage you to watch the address that Carl gave at uh, Pepperdine University a few years ago when he was awarded an honorary law degree because it is a moving testament uh, to the ideas and values that built our economy and our largest society. And you can view that on YouTube and I, I encourage you to do that. We're, we're honored to have him with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carl Schramm. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, I have been a huge fan of the Manhattan Institute. In fact, when I took over the Coffin Foundation, I tried to figure out their particular uh, formula, which Larry is the inventor of, that this small organization, I once visited the offices and was surprised by how small it was, it had such enormous influence. And as you know, I've written about making the Coffin Foundation copy your management model. And I think you, in a sense, are an extraordinary intellectual entrepreneur. Um, and America should be thankful for what you invented, uh, as should be New York, but they'll rediscover that very shortly is my hunch. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm delighted to be here for a couple of reasons. Tomorrow we're having a dinner party for 26 people, or 28 people at our house. And those of you who watched Downton Abbey, if I wasn't here, I would look very much like Daisy tonight. So um, I uh, will be back uh, uh, as a uh, sub, sub, sub altern cook tomorrow. But uh, so much uh, for that. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, as Larry said, um, when the idea was proposed by the Manhattan Institute, I was a huge enthusiast for this. The idea was that in business schools, graduate business schools, there ought to be a counter-narrative as to what was emergent as the concept of capitalism as it was ingrained in the teaching in business schools. And the parallel that was offered was the Federalist Society, an organization that had nece was necessitated to grow up around America's law schools to basically develop a thesis of the law and sense the law as it relates to the marketplace. And very much like Larry just spoke a few minutes ago when he said the Manhattan Institute, when it set out to create the Adam Smith Society, was committed to the notion of re-engendering the importance of capitalism to business schools. By the way, I'm supposed to say that if you want to hashtag this, it's Smith Talk 14, okay? And I'm also supposed to say, Molly said, dare them, okay? So anybody who does the very best tweet, and I'm the only judge, <clears throat> okay, I'll mention you in my next book, which is called Burn the Business Plan. So you can tell where I'm coming out of this, okay? Uh, I basically believe that much of the narrative in business schools must be upset in no place more than around the question of how we teach entrepreneurship. And the reason I was so fast and enthusiastic about the conception of the Adam Smith Society was that when I got to the Coffin Foundation, I actually, for the first time in my life, got to visit business schools. Now, you should appreciate I have a PhD in economics. And in economics, you basically look across the quad or the campus to the business school and think thoughts like uh, their intellectual rigor is someplace between the education school and the social work school, okay? Uh, they say it's high finance, we think it's arithmetic, okay? Uh, and whatever they talk about, they're gonna make a lot more money than we do, okay? So we retreat to the intellectual snobbery of a profession that subsequently has been discredited, okay? <laughs> so it turns out that you guys are making the right choice because at least you'll have money at the end of your years and maybe some respect that comes with the money and economists uh, get, get neither these days, okay? <laughs> and by the way, I want to make a public profession that I used to claim proudly I was a, an economist, but after the last five years, I'm now officially a social anthropologist, okay? <laughs> Anyway, to return to our talk, the reason I was so ready to talk about this and see that we could offer a little money to this group was that I began to tour business schools because business schools, when I came to the Coffin Foundation, were huge beneficiaries of our foundation. You can say that it's the Coffin Foundation that basically, my word, bribed business schools to teach about entrepreneurship. 
Now, I should tell you something of my own journey. I was first a professor of health finance at Johns Hopkins. And quite by accident, I had created a new business. The cost of that new business was tenure at Johns Hopkins. Okay, when I came up for tenure, I had 60 employees downtown in the monastery that's known as John Hop Johns Hopkins. That's, that's, that's not quite right, okay? You're either a scholar or you're one of those people. Well, uh, I had to be one of those people because it was clear they weren't going to declare me a scholar. And that began a 25-year part of my career where I was a chief executive. And at the end of that period, I got to be president of the Kauffman Foundation. Now, Mr. Kaufman had created this endowment to promote entrepreneurship. He was a fellow who never went to college. He was a great salesman. His nickname was Lucky. He started his company, Marion Laboratories, with winnings playing poker. A real entrepreneur. <laughs> and he thought at the end of his days that what he ought to do with an extra two billion was give back to America, but specifically to give back to engender entrepreneurship. He never was at college. He didn't know much about what happened in business schools. But he knew that what happened to him was a unique American experience, and that what he wanted to do with his money is stimulate more of it. So I get to a foundation, and I visit business schools, and I sit in on courses on entrepreneurship. And the narrative in those courses then and the narrative in those courses today, some of you may be taking those courses, has virtually nothing to do with the experience I had in starting five companies. You were taught a linear model. It is canonized in the Harvard Business Review. It has 11 steps. It begins with this marvelous, mysterious process of opportunity recognition. Yeah, that's right, opportunity recognition. That, that's high science, right? I always hear when those phrases are spoken that a would-be entrepreneur is supposed to look like Sherlock Holmes, right? Looking with a glass at the world and thinking that by next Tuesday, he or she better have a great idea for the beginning of a business plan. Now, being a skeptic, the Coffin Foundation, under my leadership, began real research. And one of the findings of our real research was that most firms never write a business plan, ever write a business plan, and that's true today. Zuckerberg never wrote a business plan. Jobs, Gates, uh, Larry, what's his name, never wrote a business plan, right? The guy who started Cisco never wrote a business plan. Henry Ford never wrote a business plan. So something was wrong with this picture. And then, of course, the model that survives, and boy, did it get a boost today or yesterday with a $19 million, billion dollar transaction, is that the people who are real entrepreneurs in America drop out of college, happen to live in the Silicon Valley, are bosom buddies with venture capitalists, and while they're rich when they're young. In fact, less than 2% of companies started in the United States have entrepreneurs who ever met a venture capitalist. Our fastest growing companies are founded by people when they're 39. They don't write business plans, and they've never been to business school. So everything was wrong about this picture. Now this thinking led me to yet a different perspective on this, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. And that is, what is the curriculum in business schools? Now two years ago, not quite, I had the great good fortune of being appointed in my retirement uh, to a university professorship. So suddenly I had to teach about this stuff. And I began to think very hard about what it is that's taught. And I talked to my best friend who's been a professor all his life. Like me, he's a skeptic, a contrarian. He said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to get your hands on the big monster course for freshmen, undergraduate freshmen and teach a course that's called Why Business Matters. And in his dream, it would be compulsory for every student to spend three hours examining business and why it matters. Now, by the way, I teach at a lot of universities. 
If you ask kids in a university, as I ask in my classes, who built the building that has the name on it in which our lecture hall is located? And nobody even appears to have the curious, even a curiosity about who built this building. And in virtually every case, they're entrepreneurs who left these buildings. Syracuse happens to be a particularly interesting university. Six of the original buildings were built by John Archbald, who was president of Standard Oil of New Jersey. And we have a Syracuse University student here who can attest with me. Not one in a thousand students would know that. And not as one in a thousand would know the name Lyman Smith, who was the typewriter king. He made Syracuse a dazzlingly wealthy city and is essentially the reason that university exists. Nobody's even curious about it. Why business matters? Without it, there wouldn't be any university to speak of. It matters greatly. And kids come to universities already programmed with vigorous skepticism about universities. We've heard one of the chapters talk about its plans to have, or already having had, conversations about fracking. I had a student in one of my classes last year when we were talking about the recycling of buildings and I was asking the question, is that the economic rationale? And the student answers by saying, but we were taught to recycle, reuse, and repurpose. Uh, Jake was in the classroom when I said, excuse me, we were taught you're a university student. We were taught. So the students come programmed. Now, let's talk about business schools. My favorite subject in terms of who gets programmed to think about what. Isn't it curious that the Manhattan Institute feels that a society should be formed to think about capitalism in the context of graduate business education? And it's a well-spent, it's a well-directed concern. Because in business school after business school, it's as if the general subject of capitalism doesn't exist. It's like Will Baumel says about the entrepreneur in business literature. It's about looking for the prince in Hamlet. He's never spoken of. We don't describe him. And in fact, three times in my course as president of the Kauffman Foundation, new business schools were founded. And I was the first phone call those deans got when they were named in the paper. And in each case, I said, I'll give you lots of money, multi-million dollar grants, start a curriculum, make your curriculum based on the first words out of a professor's mouth, how do businesses start? As those of you in the room understand, you can study for two years and never once consider how the Ford Motor Company got started. I was once a consultant in my merchant banking company to the Ford Motor Company. I, I was in Dearborn every week for five years. And in the employee cafeteria, everybody with an MBA, if you ask the question, what was it like the first year here? The conception that Henry Ford might have been the only person with a paycheck from the Ford Motor Company was not even part of the universe. It's as if the company dropped in from outer space fully formed. So the notion, and you know this well, and my testimony would basically be, tell me how many of you have taken courses in business history. The notion of the dynamics of a firm starting and a firm progressing and the issues that firms face in terms of growth and the Schumpeterian vision of the struggle to keep innovation in those firms in place is largely lost. And when we think about business leaders, particularly these days, we watch a business leader appear. Remember, I'm an economist, so we look at the perceived behavior. It's the as-if behavior. It's the revealed preference behavior as if their job is to collude with the government, as if their job is basically to become the champion of rent-seeking 
for companies that by themselves worry that they cannot innovate. And one reason they worry about innovation and their inability to innovate is because largely they have no historic context in terms of the creation of a company. The big bang when a company is started in the entrepreneurial thesis that must drive continuous innovation through the life of the company. Now, I suspect none of you here have ever paused to read Max Weber. Max Weber is a sociologist, so you don't want to pay any attention to him. Max Weber is there when the first big companies are formed. It wasn't all that long ago. 1880, there are no forms, new firms in the United States that have more than 100,000 employees. Big firms happen with the railroads. Big firms happen with the telephone company. And at one point, the contest in America was between the Metropolitan Life, and company, Life Insurance Company, the Prudential, and AT&T. Who's the biggest? Those firms seem to be shrinking. The thesis of bigness is under challenge. And in order to keep big in place, largely in many regards, a structure of the financing system, the collusive financing system, a financing system that notwithstanding the myths of venture capital works very hard not to have disruption from entrepreneurs. A financing system that doesn't anticipate continuous, turgid, uh, as Schumpeter would call it, the continuous gales of innovation that disturb the incumbent firms. Now, I think that's why it's so, so heartening for those of us who look at you all and the chapters you represent to see people who are actually struggling to understand the context of business. If I could retreat, by the way, just so you know the context in which your education is governed. In every case, those three cases, when I went to a dean and said, why don't you restructure and have an innovative curriculum so that the notion begins with how businesses start, so that when kids come to study finance and the management of huge firms, they can remember the entrepreneurial moments. They can remember the Weberian structure about bureaucracy contesting with innovation. They can, in fact, remember that when they're managers, there is that spark of innovation that they have to keep going. In each of those three cases, the deans of business schools say, I can't do it because we can't get accredited with that curriculum. Now, it rather seems to me that the deans of business schools are rent seekers. They have colluded with the accrediting organizations to make sure there's no disruption in that curriculum. And one of the windows that was on my mind, or you know, that I was looking through, and was in my mind when I had the phone call from the Manhattan Institute with the notion of the Adam Smith Society, was exactly this issue of the encroachment of what I saw of all places. I couldn't believe it, how naive I was, that they were teaching social entrepreneurship in the business schools. Now, I've written about this. I don't think you can examine social entrepreneurship, the curriculum about social entrepreneurship, the triple bottom line of, triple of social entrepreneurship, without seeing it as a not so thinly veiled attack on capitalism. But more importantly, what the dean see, of course, is an expanding market for people who sort of like business, who want to use the phrase entrepreneur, but never in the context of entrepreneurs who are going to start price-seeking, price-taking firms. Firms that exist to leverage a great new innovative idea. That's what the firm exists to do. I'm sure you think about that all day long. The firms you will work for, or the firms you will finance, are in fact the invention foreseen so clearly by Adam Smith, they are the invention of a society that needed to leverage entrepreneurship, that needed to be able to host innovation in a corporate form, to yeast it, to seed it, and to leverage it to growth. 
Test this question. I did this once. Uh, I think people almost threw chairs at me. It was a group of social entrepreneurs. They virtually dared me to come talk. I said, for-profit firms grow. We look to for-profit firms because they are, in fact, the leverage of growth. It is the vehicle of growth. It's the carriage of growth. It's the invention of capitalism. It is the essence, the unit of capitalism. And it helps grow. Name the social entrepreneurship organizations that grow. First answer in the room was Planned Parenthood. I said, wait a minute, that was formed in 1912. What kind of growth is that? Nobody else had another answer. The closest I can get is Habitat for Humanity or the Susan G. Komen Foundation. But the point to make is, is you can't rattle off 10 or 20 of these social entrepreneurship firms where each of you can name 40 fast-growing firms. Now, the last thing I want to say is to combine this reflection on entrepreneurship to economic growth and capitalism. And I want to leave you with a fact that no one in Washington understands. 40% of today's GDP, 40% plus, comes from firms that did not exist in 1985. Now that is an arresting fact. Not quite as arresting as to believe that the vast preponderance of people who will receive an MBA this year are clueless about that reality. Think for a moment about your curriculum. It has two pillars, two books, two great oracles. Frederick Turner, scientific management, stopwatches, And Alfred P. Sloan, the most read book in business. It's, if the Bible is the most read book and we slip over to the business world, the most published, most copies of any business book is my years at General Motors. Have any of you read it? It is the Bible of corporate bureaucracy. Think about it. There's no champion siren call to capitalism and its importance. It's the reduction of this critical issue to sort of a vague pseudoscience. So I want to leave you with a vision that what you're about to do is become business leaders who understand the great clockworks of capitalism. It's great that the name is Adam Smith. Smith saw so clearly the nexus between the entrepreneur's energy, political freedom, stability in the currency provided by the government as perhaps its biggest role added to keeping tariffs down, and seeing the business person as the champion of industry, the person who saw his or her calling to deliver the new, to create jobs. As you know, because of the Coffin Foundation's research, Virtually all new jobs in the United States are created in firms less than five years old. And the third job of the entrepreneur is to create all the new wealth in our society. When these new firms aren't born, and when old firms stop behaving like entrepreneurial firms, this economy grinds to a halt. As the handmaidens of this great clockworks, as the leaders of corporations, and financing institutions, as potential entrepreneurs yourselves, and I would dare say all of you should be, one way or the other, it is up to you to keep this great clockworks going. And the real challenge, and the real reason the Manhattan Institute is so invested in this, is because its first principle is the principle of personal freedom as the avenue to personal dignity. We don't have that if we don't have free markets, companies that make wealth, and ensure the freedom to innovate and to grow and to keep jobs and, again, to make wealth. It is the fundamental basis of civilization. Thank you.
Uh, we're going to take, uh, I'm going to take, forget the we, okay, unless I may call for uh, support or troop reserves here. I'm going to take uh, questions, okay? So if anybody has any questions, I know I gave you the complete text of every question, the answer to every question you might ever have, but go ahead, dare me. Come on. Yes, here's a question. I don't care what Michael Porter said. That's my answer. Okay. <clears throat> That's fair enough. Um, see, Quadruple bottom line? Forget it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> see, so you talked about one of the myopic aspects of business schools. We are studying to t tinker with corporations that are already large that might not think about the history of where those corporations started. But I just wonder if you, in your conversations with business school deans trying to pitch them on this new curriculum, a lot of business schools came to prominence in the 50s, right, where they finally said, hey, we have people coming back from World War II. We find America does have huge firms to take care of now. So given that maybe business schools grew up and became popular to meet a need, right, to train basically a corporate bureaucracy, what do you think is the role of large corporations in an, eco in an economy that still has entrepreneurship thriving? So I appreciate your call to entrepreneurship. It's exciting. We want to live in an economy that has that. But maybe, what is maybe the spirited defense of that slow-moving corporate behemoth? What role does it play? Does it have a positive role? What do you see that as? Well, the corporate behemoth is obviously a great competitor, but what you have to do when you examine it is what is its future? Okay, J.D. Thompson tells us that the critical question for organizations is are we prepared for the future? And the real test of it is, the, the acid test in the laboratory is, can we make our future by ourselves in the marketplace? And too many of those great bohemoths, which I love the way you characterize, slow-moving bohemoths, right, no longer have an entrepreneurial spirit. What their entrepreneurship is, in the words of Will Baumel, is they've become very, very entrepreneurial at rent-seeking. That is taking over government, looking for support. Now, that's dandy if you run one of these places. And you know if you're in the C-suite, you will have a phalanx of lawyers and you will have a big office in Washington, and I have had these jobs, okay, and I've been in those jobs. And when you're a chief executive, let me advise you about two things. I went to law school and never practiced. It, came great, it became great background when I was CEO. Because when you call in the corporate counsel and the phalanxes who come with them and the outside law firms, and you say, we've got to do this, they say, we can't do that, okay? Now, I could always say, but I went to law school, go get another answer. And then they'll all scurry away. The chief executive, the boss says, maybe we don't have the answer right. It, it was all a sham, but they always got the right answer somehow, okay? And the second thing that you want to do as a CEO, so play like you're a lawyer. Just say, you know, I didn't go to law school, but I read law at night, okay? So go get a better answer. The other thing you want to say is, I don't want to hear the phrase, well, Washington as a town works a little differently, right, than Dubuque, okay? That town is a town of rent seekers. Every time I go into that town, I start to perspire. Because what I see in those great boulevards, avenues, very expensive restaurants, is the tariff that's imposed on the whole rest of the country, giving lawyers and lobbyists and people who, in fact, do press special interests. And no special interests are pressed harder than corporate special interest. And as you said, there was a time when business school conceived of ethics, and this is the ethical standard whispered to us quite clearly in the moral sentiments that this is not what business is about. Okay? So compete in the market. Be proud of it. And be competent at it. Next question. Here we go. And, and you're from Talk. Texas. From Dartmouth. Dartmouth, yes. Yep. Just like um, I said. My question is about sort Dallas, of, New Hampshire. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my question is about um, sort of modern democracy. And I think one of the things that I worry about is when you look at the incentive structure of modern democracies, it yields, I think, social democracy. Um, you have people able to um, leverage sort of short-term interests for big long-term costs. 
And so do you think that um, modern democracy is able to, to deliver the world that you sort of imagine? I think, it's, I think it's probably one of the most important challenges that face civilization. And incidentally, if it wasn't clear because it was, not, it was in, implied in my remarks, business is perhaps the single strongest force to resist it. And at the moment, business is in fact endorsing it, subscribing to it, and supporting it, i.e. the managerial state, the collusive state the state of rent-taking uh, special interests. And it's, a, it's hard to actually find a firm that stands up to it, because it's very difficult. You know, in the last few days, we've had this flapdoodle about the FCC coming into newsrooms. And when I'm driving around listening to the radio, you hear commentators say, no newsroom in the country is going to let those people in. Journalist ethics, they'll, be, they'll have hives. They'll be allergic. It'll never happen. They'll stand at the door with a bayonet wrong, right? Because what business schools help to teach is if you run ABC communications and you run XYZ communications, you're going to hope you can play with the FEC or the FCC to your advantage. We teach that in political science, for heaven's sakes. And I suspect it's taught in business school courses on business relationship with government, the iron triangle, how legitimate it is, and how you play it to the best interest of your corporation. And it does bear exactly on your question, the survival of democracy. That's why the Adam Smith Society exists. You're supposed to ask those questions and then act upon the right answer. And you have those same concerns, because I know you went to West Point. You have those same concerns when you examine the American military. Yes. So I find that you've done a brilliant job of kind of deconstructing the modern agenda of the MBA program. Can you help me reconstruct what an idealized MBA program might look like if there weren't some of these accreditation barriers? Well, I, I do spend some time at that, or thinking about that, because, um, you know, I'm sort of this uh, odd combination of intellectual and businessman who actually sees business schools as very important. You, I mean, you're the hothouse of the leadership of this critical event. That's why I began by saying, you know, if I had my druthers, we would teach as the very first course for undergraduates why business matters, okay? So what would be uh, the course? I've actually thought about this, and I don't want to bore you to death, but it would start with a course on how firms are formed. Firm formation, not entrepreneurship, okay? And what goes into it? And the elements as I see it are, first of all, a real innovation. That's why I make so much fun of this notion of opportunity recognition. Firms don't start because somebody looked on Thursday for a great idea to write a business plan starting in their course on Tuesday, which is the convention in many business schools. Right? You're going to write a business plan. This is introduction to entrepreneurship. So on Tuesday, we're going to start, and you better come back with a great idea. It's not for nothing when you judge collegiate business plan competitions that over half of the businesses proposed relate to selling onto the campus. And why not? Nobody knows the outside world. So if you go looking for an opportunity, you're going to look at the cafeteria, what the cafeteria does with its extra food and all that other stuff. So the real question is innovation. And incidentally, when we teach on innovation, in universities and in business schools, we teach about what innovation does to business. It's disruptive. You can use it like jujitsu. You can use it as a weapon against somebody else, but you are not taught how innovation, honest to God, happens. And the second thing, and you could build an entire curriculum about this, and the second thing is the ambition for scale. How do you grow scale? And all the other stuff are ancillary subjects. Finance, marketing, human resource. The real issue is who are the people, what is the idea, and what is the aspiration for growth? The other subjects are adjuncts. They're the tools to get you there. Uh, 
I'm happy to call it quits if you're happy to call it quits. Thank you.